Hey everyone, welcome back to Sevenfold Design Technology. Today we're looking at a Revit workflow with Rhino Inside to help get your material parameters set on an instance by instance basis. So it's pretty simple once you get the hang of it. This investigation took me about 90 minutes to figure out, but I hope to get this done in about 15 minutes or so. Let's go ahead and take a look at the finished product. So this is in Revit. And basically what we have here is um, just a gradient pattern that's actually defining and writing to the Revit materials library in our project. And you can see I've just given it a simple name that is the RGB value. It's set to use the render appearance and it's also overwriting um, some of the physical assets involved. And so I'll show you exactly how to get this working um, and also so that the material assets aren't shared. So um, the finished workflow is a couple segments here. I'll just show you real quickly. It's basically um, the majority of our section is going to be focusing on the material, uh, the materials here, working with um, setting the surface patterns, working with the assets a little bit, creating some custom materials from scratch to based on this gradient here and uh, eventually getting that back into Revit. So uh, if you're not familiar with how to work with setting parameters on instance by instance basis, go ahead and download the latest the latest Rhino inside, you should know that by the dedicated tab it has here in Revit and launch that up and we'll get started. Hey, if we're just meeting for the first time, my name is Tim Halverson. This is Sevenfold Design Technology where we're unlocking your creativity through the power of design technology in architecture. So if you like that and are curious about learning all different types of things, not just Rhino and Grasshopper, definitely consider subscribing and whenever you feel like it, hitting that like button on the video. All right, let's go ahead and dive into the lesson. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to the original script here and I'm just going to close this other document down just so we're not getting run right inside confused. Okay. So if you've watched previous tutorials, you can definitely uh, check that out on how we made this in the first place. But the main thing I want to focus on here is I have these four point adaptive component panels and I've got a dedicated uh, data type, which is an instance parameter called panel material. So this is uh, a material data type. It's not strings. It's not text. And I can basically specify that here. Now at the moment, linen comma white is the uh, one material that's applied to all these right now. And I've got three different types and and we, we did that in a previous tutorial. But uh, let's go ahead and start to set up the script. So I'm gonna go to Rhino inside, I'm gonna go to Grasshopper and launch that up. And it looks like it's right here. I'm just gonna twirl that open. And then I'm just gonna go to File New and just start up a new document, okay? So the two parameters that I'm gonna be working around mostly in Rhino inside, so if you go to the R tab, and if you're not seeing it like this, I just say display as icons. And I do have display full names on so we can read the around inside components a little bit better. Uh, but the, the two components we're going to be working most around to set this is under the element dropdown and you get and set parameters. And again, with the updated round inside set parameter, set element parameter does work for material parameter values. Okay, so let's just drop these two on the canvas. Okay, so these are get and set. And now we need to, um, our parameter key is gonna be that, <clears throat> that parameter value I just mentioned. So panel material is my uh, parameter name. Let me just make some space here. Put this off to one side and grasshopper on the other side. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm just gonna do quotes and panel material to pull up a panel. And I'm gonna use that as both my parameter key in both cases, okay? Then I'm gonna go query my elements. So to do that, I'm gonna to go to input and do model category picker. And I'm gonna, I know that my adaptive components are a generic model because I can tell right here by looking at that. So it's a generic model. Then I'm gonna to go to element, query elements. And I wanna get all these elements. So I need to add a filter here. You can see there's a filter. So I'm gonna go to the filter dropdown and I'm gonna do family. Okay, 
So what I want to do is I want to go ahead and go to the family dropdown, go to query families, and that's going to be the first step I want to do here. So, um, so before we go to the filters dropdown, I'm going to feed generic models into category, and then I'm going to filter by name, and I'm just going to type this in adaptive four point surface. Okay. So typing that in case sensitive, feeding that into name. Now when I do a quotes and check out the results of this, I can see I'm getting that family. Okay, cool. So now I do want to get all the types of that family. So I'm going to query types as well. And so let's just go into the type dropdown and query types. And I'm going to feed that family name in. And I should be getting all of the types back here. And I might have been able to skip that step actually. Let's just test that real quick. So I think if I just skip this whole step here, went directly to category and family name, yeah, I'd be getting the same result. So I uh, didn't need that stuff. Okay, let's save some time. All right, so, and I'm getting all the types in that family. Okay, cool. So now I wanna just get rid of these filters and I wanna apply that filter here. So if I use this types filter again, filter, type filter, I can feed those types in and then insert that filter into the, again, query elements uh, component. And I should be getting all of that, but you can see the warning here is saying element contains only the first hundred. So I'm gonna adjust my limit to make sure I get all of them. So I'm just setting that to 10,000 and feeding that in. Okay, cool. So now, I can get a preview in Revit if I want to. I could also take a look if I go to pot, uh, go to Rhino Inside and launch Rhino. I should be able to start seeing uh, this information here. One thing I can do is do element geometry. So if I go to element geometry right here, that's gonna take it from Revit and extract. This might be a little bit heavy, so just be careful but I'm gonna hit elements and just feed those in. That'll give me a preview in both the Rhino and the Revit space, okay? And if I wanna turn off the preview over here, if it's getting too heavy, I can just go to the Grasshopper tab and, and turn it off there. Okay, so let me make some space for the Rhino preview. So we're gonna work primarily with the Rhino preview for now. Okay, so there's the Rhino preview. Okay, so the next thing I wanna do is, I've got my elements feeding in, and there's all my panels. The next thing I wanna do is get my color gradient, and to save some time, I'm just gonna pull the gradient from my previous uh, script here. So I'm gonna copy that out. This is gonna be the colorations we set up. Okay, so that's way down here. Got the gradient ready to go. And um, let's see, how, how do we get there? Well, okay, let's take a look at what the existing material that we have is. So I can take all these elements now and I can feed those elements into this uh, get, get element parameter. So if I feed those in right away, we can see what's coming out. And we're seeing that it's this linen comma white that we talked about. So we wanna swap that out um, on a per instance basis. So to query all that information up here, when we get the geometry, we're just getting those untrimmed surfaces from our, those are our NURB surfaces. And that's coming from our adaptive component. So what I'm gonna do is actually, uh, in the original script, I have this base surface, which is a direct shape, again, from a previous tutorial, but I'm just gonna unhide that and use that as my evaluation surface, okay? So to get that into the script here, I'm gonna go back to the, the params tab, go to Revit primitives, and then go to graphical element. And this is the most basic, uh, sort of simple manual reference you can get, uh, to my knowledge. The rest of this is more rule-based. I'm just gonna do graphical element, and I'm gonna right click on that and say, set one graphical element. And I'm gonna go into Revit and pick that direct shape. Okay. 
And now that's coming in. So you can see here that green is previewing it. So now I'm just gonna extract that front face um, to, to evaluate against. So to do that, let's go to surface tab and deconstruct BRUP, feed that BRUP in. And you can see it's giving me a warning because right now it's still Revit geometry. We haven't made it into Rhino uh, native geometry, even though I can see it. Uh, so to do that, I'm just gonna alt drag a copy of this Probably not the best to alter your copy, I should have brought a fresh one in, but I'm just gonna feed that element in here. And then if I check the, the output, that's just giving me a B rep. So now I can feed that in. And now we've got sort of native, native geometry to Rhino. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna just hide these and we're gonna work with these faces. So one simple logic, I'm gonna reduce my options is I'm gonna test for area against these faces here. And then I'm gonna sort. And I'm gonna sort all these faces by area. And by default, the output is the lowest area at top, but I know the biggest faces are my outside faces. So I'm gonna reverse this list, uh, just right click and reverse. And that, if I just check the keys, you'll see that'll put the top, the ones with the largest area towards the top. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna do, uh, list item, just typing in item, and zoom in and grab the, the top two. And then I'm just gonna do a surface container, just typing in SRF and feeding that in and just checking the preview here to see which one I'm getting. So I'm gonna hide the rest of these for now. And let's see here. So we've got the outside surfaces we've extracted, whoops. Okay, and then I just wanna get the sort of closest one. It doesn't really matter for the, our purposes, but I'm just gonna get, to get the closest one and hide that. Okay, cool. Now I've got my evaluation surface I wanna test against, and I want to get some points. So let's grab the area once again of each of my panels. Okay, so that's gonna be my testing point. You can see right there, the center point. And I'm gonna pull those to this surface. Okay, so let's do, um, actually, I don't need to do that. I'm gonna do this, in this case, the logic I'm gonna use is a different method. So instead of curve closest point and surface closest point, I'm gonna evaluate it relative to the global XY plane. So I'm gonna go to vector, I'm gonna go to plane, and I'm gonna say plane coordinates. Okay, and this one is gonna evaluate some points against um, a coordinate system. And that coordinate system I wanna use is the global XY plane. So I'm gonna feed that in, it's my coordinate system, and I'm gonna feed my centroids into the point. And the result is gonna be a whole bunch of Z values. So this is a you know 394 foot um, building. And uh, again, just working in, in Imperial, it doesn't really matter for your uh, design purposes. This method will work for you too. Okay, so we got a whole bunch of values ranging from 394 all the way down to, you know, like four. Okay. So I realized now when I first explored this method that I had, I had done curve uh, surface closest point. And so I'd originally taken this base surface and wanted to evaluate all these points against that surface. And then I was gonna extract um, the, this UV point here, which you can see is um, zero for the W, which is the offset. And then it's got a UV point, which is relative coordinates um, to this. So basically the surface doesn't um, curve too much. The only difference between this method directly and this method here, which I could explode point from Let's go ahead and deconstruct point. The only difference between these two methods is um, this one is gonna be sort of following along the curvature of my surface. The other one is essentially just drawing um, a straight line, vertical, and it's just doing this. And so it's basically just drawing it vertical, slicing it at the Z value, and then um, 
mapping the color based on that. So if you want to be like more explicit with a different curvature, just add a curve, a surface closest point, and then deconstruct that UV point um, along that. Okay, so both methods will work. So now um, what we wanna do is, and then the Y versus the X would be your options here. So the X and Y here are the equivalent of your U and V. So um, if, if it's not flowing in the direction you want, you can always um, go back to the surface that you evaluated over here, which you've put into this container, and you can pull up a direction component if it's not uh, working it. So I think it's um, flip, no, reverse surface. Here we go, reverse surface direction. This is essentially the exact same as the DIR uh, direction command in Rhino. And you can feed that surface in. And if you hover on that, it says zero, do nothing, one reverse, two reverse, three reverse U and V. So um, you can see those options there. So feel free to customize this if it doesn't work for you directly. But um, for this method, I'm just gonna stick with the simple sort of Z, relative Z um, method. So both of these will do the same, same thing. Okay. So we'll, we'll just kind of move this component downstream for now and let's keep moving. So the next thing we want to do is prepare our values. So the values I want to do, so right now, these are all, um, there's a couple ways to do this. I could re-parameterize this surface before it comes in. That's going to normalize this to be a percentage from zero to one. Uh, so if I just undo that real quick, <clears throat> oh, look at that, it's not working, okay, it's fun. So if I don't reparameterize this, you'll see that that's to 15. And um, what I like to do is just go to the uh, math tab, go to domain, go to bounds, and I will, I'm gonna use the Y component, and I'm gonna flatten the incoming list because this will give me a range based on all the values in my list um, to get the min and max of that. So it's going from two to 331. And um, so then what I can do is go to remap numbers. Again, this might be redundant if I just uh, sort of reparameterize that here, it would have done this for me, but um, I'm just gonna show you this way. Many ways to cook a chicken. Okay. so. The source, it, these, the source domain and the target domain. The source is this min max. The target by default, you can see there is zero to one. So I'm just gonna leave that uh, unplugged with the default values. And then I'm just gonna keep this grafted as is and feed that into the values. So then the output is gonna be squishing that down uh, to be some relative percentage between zero to one. Okay, why is that important? What we need to do now is set up how we're slicing our gradient up into panel types and then picking which value along that list from this gradient we want to be using um, for our, our material. Okay, so I'm going to start with domain and I'm going to say divide domain. And by default, it's, uh, it is also going from zero to one. I want to be more explicit. I could show this by just constructing a do domain. It's um, from zero to one. It saves a bit of time since you know it's the default, but that's what's going on. That domain is feeding into both this divide domain component. Again, that's right there. And then the it's going to be the target that I'm mapping to. So this is this is the new domain. And now I want to define how many times I'm dividing it up. So let's just type something. I'm gonna do 20 segments. Feel free to you know put this on a slider, you know, and and just kind of work with how many divisions you want. Just note that when we get to the end of this, if you change this number, I wouldn't slide it. I would double click and change it because it's gonna affect the materials we regenerate over in Revit. So I'm just gonna do 20 for now, and just hit count. Okay, put that into count. And what it's giving me as a result is it's splitting up the domain from zero to one. 
into these 5% increments. Okay. So now I just want to get um, a value. I want to get 20 values that land in the middle of each of these domains. Okay. So I'm also going to do a range component. So let's go to sets uh, and range right here. And the domain, once again, is my input domain. The steps should be uh, this 20 divisions. And if we check this out, it's actually going to give me one additional. So it's 21 values. Um, cause again, we started at zero. So what I want to do is shift this halfway between this one and this one for each of these. Okay. So, and then I'm going to clip off the last one so that it lands in the middle of each of these domains. Again, feel free to let me know in the comments if you have a better, better method than this, but this is how I'm doing it. Um, I had originally thought I could just go to steps here, do X minus one and do that, but then it would do this awkward percentage in between, it would still land at one, so that wouldn't be landing um, kind of in the middle of these. So I wanted to just do a nice clean median between each of these values. Okay, so let's undo that. And I'm gonna go ahead and just grab a list item component and feed that in, and then add the first and the second index there. And I'm gonna get the difference between those. So I'm just gonna do minus for subtraction. And uh, there's a couple ways to do this, but um, I'm just gonna do the difference of these. It'll give me a negative result. And then I'll just do ABS for absolute value. That's so gonna give me a sort of solid value. Um, again, I could have, whatever, I'm not gonna explain all the exceptions. Okay, so <laughs> there's a million ways to do this. Okay, so I've got the difference that I wanna add to. And now I just wanna, uh, add that with a plus icon, a plus addition. I'm gonna feed all my numbers in and I'm gonna add 0.05 to it, okay? And I did this calculated rather than explicitly because if we change the number of divisions right here, then that number is gonna change. So this is a relative calculated value. And then I just wanna make sure I'm dropping off that last one so I have just 20 values. So do that, I'm gonna do last index of this list here. And if I hover on that, you can see 20 is the index, which is this one. And we go to sequence right here and call index. And just go to that indice and go there. And let's see what the result is. Okay, cool. So we've got our 20 values. All right, so the next step is to use these as our sample sample color. So when I feed that into the parameter, if I don't touch this upper and lower limit, again, that defaults to zero and one, then instead of 20 percentages, I'm gonna be getting 20 RGBs. Okay, here's my RGBs. And that's sort of going along here and slicing it up. So now I can expect once I map those to my panels, I can get that gradient applied. All right, so this is one of the, the fun parts here. So what we wanna do is come back to our split domains and I wanna go to the math tab and domain, go down to includes and I wanna check, I wanna check all these values which are already grafted and these, these graft branches are important because they represent each panel. Okay, so we kept the structure in place so that we could have it um, finding each panel. So don't flatten this even if you're tempted to. So we're gonna check those values against each of these 20 domains. And what that's gonna give me as a result is it's gonna go through the entire list of these domains here and it's gonna see which value from this remapped list is true. And I should expect to only have one true value because of how I've set this up. Okay, so now we just need to figure out from this list which index is it coming from. So to do that, let's go and pull out a member index. And this is the set I'm gonna be testing against and the value I'm looking for is a true. So I just pull up a Boolean toggle 
And uh, it's important to do it this way because if you just did true with a panel, you'd have to convert it to a Boolean type because this is just a string. Um, so you'd have to do an extra step. Uh, either way, you have to have a Boolean type to make this work. I'm also gonna set that to true and feed that into the member we're searching for. And now what you can see is the result is the index that it's true. So you can see here at this top level um, and it grafted it, but this top level index zero was true. And then if we go down here, um, index number one was true. So just know that it's going through the entire list on all 2000 something panels, checking that, see here on 895, it found index 14 was true and it's feeding that index over here. Okay. So now all we need to do to structure that data is do once again, a list item. The list we're picking from is our RGB values and I'm gonna feed those indexes in to pick from. So the result is a different, um, a different RGB each time. Now I don't want that additional graft on there. So I'm gonna go ahead and shift that back. Just doing shift paths. I was recently inspired by a talk. Okay. So that keeps it kind of clean. Um, and I'm not gonna worry about simplifying this. Like we're fine. We're good to go. Um, everything's on its own branch. Okay, so moving on to the part you've been waiting for. Uh, this is the part where we start to get all the materials generated in Revit, and then we're gonna reassign those materials in uh, Grasshopper. So let's go ahead and save this now. So the big components we're looking for here is, okay, so the original elements, Okay, let's, let's do this one last. This is the last step here. Okay, so the components we're gonna be working with in Revit, in the Revit tab, under material, um, there's a couple things to understand before we dive in. So create material, this is one. Um, another one we're gonna need is query materials. Let's drop that on the canvas. Then we're gonna need um, material graphics. And we'll all explain all these here in a second. So we need all these. And then finally, we're actually gonna need this create appearance asset. All right, so there's create asset and then there's modify asset. Let's understand the structure first before we dive too, too deep into this. So if we go into Revit, make that full screen, under the manage tab over in materials. Okay, each of these is a material. Now, if I was to do this the manual way, let's look up. So right now um, I've got linen comma white as my fabric type that we've currently applied to all these panels. And that doesn't really make a lot of sense. But what we're about to do automatically is right click and say duplicate as many times as we've specified in Grasshopper. So, you know, and then we'll rename it and it's gonna be some kind of RGB value, okay, whatever that is. Um, and then it's gonna adjust the appearance. Now, this, this hand icon is really critical to understand. Okay, so if I actually go over here to replace this asset, it's gonna open up the asset browser. And this is this secret. So this, this mysterious underworld of Revit uh, near the Earth's core, <laughs> is the asset browser in Revit. And it's still warm there, don't worry, you don't need a jacket. But <laughs> but this uh this is basically the back end, the back end of the materials in uh Revit. And I still to this day, I've used Revit for a long time, like 8 years now, 9 years. Um <laughs> I still don't understand why this is here and why this is here. Like, I don't understand why there's two. I, I think there should just be one material browser. But what's going on is, since I duplicated that, if I was to go in to the back end here and change this, right? Let's just 
change it to color instead of an image. And let's just pick maybe a, a more flashy like red, for example, and get rid of the bump. Okay, I'm gonna apply that. Notice what happens right here. We just changed both linen white, linen common white, even though we didn't want to. We did because they're shared, because this is shared. So I have yet to find an application for where I can do an instance change and keep the type change. I always, 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 always have to hit this button here to duplicate the asset, which you can see now creates a duplicate in the asset browser way back here, which happens, which it happens to be the same name, right? Uh, <laughs> it's back here somewhere. So there's just, it's confusing. Okay. All that to say, we need to break this relationship. Okay. So that there's no, there's no shared, there's no shared assets. That's all I really know. I don't understand too much more than that. Other than this relationship basically always needs to be broken uh, when you're trying to do renderings. Okay. Enough said. So if we, I'm just going to leave it red. That's fine. Whatever. We're going to change this in a second. And if you need to find all that, you can go to manage and additional settings and it's buried over here in material assets, which is in this awkward asset editor. And then if you twirl this little guy open, that's going to open up the asset browser once again. Okay. Enough on that. That's the thing we're writing to. That's the thing we're editing in grasshopper. So hopefully you never need to worry about it again, other than the fact that if that's why your renderings are not looking good, that's probably why. Okay, enough on that. It's this mysterious place. Don't forget the oxygen mask. Okay, so if, <laughs> if we are back here, okay, once again, this is our appearance asset, right? We got it, it's right there. There's two steps. Typically, uh, what I've learned so far in Rhino Inside is it likes to generate a new asset, and then if you wanna adjust that same asset later, you need to pull out a model, uh, a modify appearance asset. So there's, there's sort of generate, and then there's a modify. Um, yeah, let's not go too deep on theory for this, let's just do the exercise. So for now, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna keep this simple. And I had a couple thoughts on this since I did the live exercise. <clears throat> because if we name all of these according to their RGB values, every time we change the number of divisions back here, the name's gonna change, which is gonna require a brand new material to be generated. However, if we pull out uh, the list indices, and I can't believe how many times I use this component, but this is Parfish component. And if I do that, and then we build up a little custom name here, I can just concatenate, just doing the ampersand, and we'll just say panel material as a panel, fragment A. I'm gonna just drag, alter your copy, add a little space right there, just a little space, and then I'm gonna zoom in and increase that and add this. So now what I've got is a custom name that is flowing out a, a unique name. So then if the RGB value changes on this, um, it doesn't require a new material to be generated every single time. Okay. And I'm actually gonna just increment this plus one just because I want it to because I want this to start at one just because of how I think. Okay, so one is one. Okay, so now that is going to be our name. Now we need a template. What is the template? Did it not need a template? Interesting. Let's see if that made something happen. 
because since it turns black, if it turns pink, it's basically not regenerated yet. And if it turns black, then that's going to be it's processed into the Revit environment. OK, I see you. And of course, because Revit is Revit, um, it can't sort properly. <laughs> OK, love you, Revit. OK, so let's just do one more thing. I'm going to lock this solver. I'm going to undo that create material push. If we check that one more time, those have gone away. So just like Grasshopper, if you do something wrong in Round Inside, you can totally go back up to the undo and revert that sort of calculation um, and then adjust your script. So all I want to do is adjust the format. I'm just going to add some leading zeros uh, just because I'm a little annoyed by the alphanumeric sorting that was happening in Revit. So I'm going to feed my numbers in to the data and I'm going to do quotes and open brackets. I'm going to say n zero colon zero zero close brackets. And I believe believe this should do something for me. And I'm going to freeze this component here. I'm going to unlock the solver and we will see Ah, okay, there we go. And I think there's a couple of syntaxes. So I just added leading zeros. If I did like N zero, that adds like the commas in there. Uh, and there's this whole syntax thing out there. I can totally link that in the description if you guys need it. There we go. So zero, zero is gonna give me those leading zeros here on my numbers. Okay. And then feed that text into A. And there's my result. Okay, awesome. So now um, what I'm going to do is just add that in as a material. Now, here, here's the thing I was making a point to do before. So if I go back, let's go upstream for a second. And let's travel back in time to a day when we actually queried the value of all these materials. Okay, And we saw that they were all the same. If we had queried this down, we could find the unique values in this list. And you can do that just by doing create set. Uh, this is kind of like unique items in Dynamo. Um, so it looks like I've only got one material applied in this entire set. Okay, cool. And if I wanted to be careful, I could just pick a single list item and just make sure I'm only getting one item out of that list. So that could be my new template. And see here, one thing in your naming conventions I learned is you have to avoid the temptation to use a colon because that is one of the key syntax uh, that it uses to keep things structured and pretty. Uh, so don't use colons. But um, if we pull out that Revit material and feed that in to our template right here, Okay, so I'm just going to call this Okay. This is a one time operation. Let's be very clear. We are we are pushing the materials into Revit once and then we're deleting those components and we're coming back in to modify them and, and swap them out. So to do that, I'm going to enable this component and it's going to do its thing. Hey, thanks so much for tuning into this one. And we're almost done with this workflow. If you're curious and liking this so far, definitely hit the like button. It helps get the message out, get this YouTube video content into people just like you who are curious to learn about uh, sort of design technology in architecture. And if you'd like a more structured learning environment, all these courses and videos can be found over at the BIM Academy bimacademy.sevenfold.io that's also linked in the description below or on the banner um, sort of embedded in this video here. Um, also, if you sign up there, you will get on the email newsletter, which will notify you when upcoming live streams are happening. 
fresh videos are dropping on YouTube and if any new courses uh, are released. So definitely consider getting on the newsletter. I um, am only publishing as needed, so you don't, don't expect a lot of email from me right away. And I uh, definitely don't wanna be in the sort of spammy folder. Uh, just trying to get you useful design technology learning in your process. All right, so thanks so much for your curiosity, my friend, and let's go ahead and finish up this tutorial. Okay, so sometimes it appears that Rhino Inside will just freeze for no apparent reason. This thing will turn pink, and I believe uh, it will turn black when things are good. Yep, there it's black now. And let's check it out. So you can see we've got that panel 01, 02, 03, blah, blah, blah. And it went ahead and checked out the, the same material asset as before, which is that same red that we had issues with. But at least it's all derived from the same material. So we've got 20 shared uh, materials, 20 shared materials, and they're all pulling from the same spot. Awesome. Okay, so now, now that we have those made, I can go ahead and actually delete this or let's just disable this just so we don't lose that. But there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna save this. So the next thing is, these always take longer than you expect. All right. So I want to, now, if I take each of these and use that text string as the name I'm filtering for, okay, that should go ahead and pull out those materials. Okay. And I do want to just also flatten that list. So we have 20 values just like before. And just like we did back here, it's on a flat list. That's on purpose. Okay. So, so now what we're gonna do is use this, uh, this component here. And this is the, let's see, material graphics component. And this is interesting because this, there's a lot of this in Rhino where it's both a get parameter and a set parameter. What do I mean by that? Um, basically you can, if you feed data into the color input, that's gonna write data to all the materials that we apply here. So if I feed those materials in, again, because I have this colon set, it's red materials, this is all sort of good. And I know it's exactly the names of the materials uh, I wrote before. See, those are the names. Now it's got that red material prefix. This is in fact a material in my document and I already confirmed that. Cool, so I can feed those in, okay. And, and I feed those out, it's gonna just be a pass through, but now I can start to change all the values. So if I just feed that in directly on this end, you can see uh, this is querying, right? This is basically pulling out what is, what is the uh, sort of render appearance color transparency. So you could do some logic where you use two of these components, you pass through the material on both, right? You query on one end, do some logic and then rewrite it on the other end. Totally fine with that. We already have our logic in place, so we don't need to do those queries. So what we want is the colors to be picked, okay? Yeah, so there's a couple things we wanna do. So eventually we're gonna write the correct material to the elements, and then we're gonna override those colors. So to visualize this, let's start by writing the instance values to our elements. Okay, so the elements we want, I'll get to that in a second. Okay, so the parameter key is that panel material parameter. And then parameter value, this is the material output, okay? So we basically just need to take this list of materials and just like before with the item index component, I'm just gonna alt drag or copy that and I'm gonna override the name and say Selected materials. Okay, selected materials. 
and the list, it's the same indexes, right? Same indexes as before. And those, um, yeah, so much to explain. But we'll just pick from these materials here, okay? So that's our list of materials, those 20 materials. And now I'm picking from that list of 20 on a per panel basis, I'm setting all that. So now all I need to do is find the elements I'm writing that to. So here's the value that's going to be. And the elements, I just need to check my data before I do it, is my panels, which are way back here. So let's go to the elements over here. And all I need to do is graft, graft each of these elements. Okay, and you can see that's going to give me that four uh, sort of digit branch. It's going to go all the way up to, you know, 2,438. Okay. And if I just drag this to the end, let's see how it's comparing against our data. So you can see because I wasn't flattening and grafting and shifting paths too much throughout, I've actually got matching data branches. So you can see here that four digit code is exactly the same for each. I could just kind of put that on top just to compare but I've got the same branch structure for both. So I can, with confidence, take my grafted uh, elements and just feed that into the element here. Okay. Now, at first, we may not see a change because we duplicated the material, but we haven't overridden the color. Come in. You got this. Hashtag automation, woohoo. Okay, so a lot just happened. It doesn't feel like it because it's still all red, but I probably should have saved that for the climax. <laughs> Ugh. Okay. We just did a lot of processing and it was very anticlimactic because we're still red over here, but a lot just happened. Panel 18 has been assigned. And now we just gotta do the easy part, which is assigning each of those colors to the material, okay? So let's do it. So there's all my Revit materials, and now I just need to go back to my RGBs, which is these 20 values here, and just feed those into the color input. Boom. And it'll take a second to think. Okay, so this actually was inverse of what we did previously. So if I hide element, you can see if I go to consistent colors, there is the magic result. Now this one is actually was flowing the other direction. Now if I wanted it to go vertically, there's only one change I have to do, super simple. Oops. Okay. One change is if I go back upstream, so you can see what I did is I basically took the material, I overrode the color and modified it, but then I already had it assigned over here. So there's two, two operations that were happening in this case. So one was finding the elements and picking the material. The other one was updating that material itself. So you may have to do some enabling and disabling, but if it's not going the right direction, all I need to do is trace back up to my logic layer, which is where I input the Y component. And I can just use control shift and drag that to the X component. Or like I mentioned, I could um, work with the surface direction here, but I'm just gonna change it to the X component here. And that should just change that out for me. So this is one of those things where you might want to iteratively check this with a preview in Rhino before you push all of those material changes to Revit because it's a lot faster. But knowing that you can still keep the data in sync once you actually do want to write your changes over to Revit. So um, definitely, <laughs> definitely leverage the preview component in Rhino.
Okay, awesome. So you can see with that one change at the logic layer, it's it's already gone ahead and automatically adjusted it. And you can see a pretty distinct separation. You can see this middle band has a different color, right? There's a pretty distinct band in there, even though it's subtle. So we can know with confidence that we have only 20 materials. And if we wanted to reduce the complexity, we could change that parametrically, you know, and um, basically this, if I change this to 10, it would go back through, reprocess, it would override um, panel one through 10, or if we went above that to like 35, 40, whatever, it's gonna add materials as needed and then just update um, the materials in the Revit document um, to to be the latest gradient color. So we never, we can basically figure out how many unique colors we are allowed in our design and sort of work with that value engineering process. Okay, I don't know why this is not panning. Come on, buddy. Work with me here. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so good stuff. Um, I guess I got in a bit of a, a feedback loop there. So, yeah okay so good to go um yeah and then we can just confirm that this is working if we go ahead and do a test render so i'm pretty confident but let's check so if we go to view and go to render we can just pull up a draft here let's see how it goes All right, yep, I remember we forgot. There's one more step we have to do. So, so we have the surface colors working, but now, now we actually have to change out the material asset itself. So this is where we talk about adding a material asset and the color attached with it. So. I'm going to take those colors once again, feed that into generate appearance asset. And then I'm also going to just use the same name as the material. So this is going to go through and it's going to add those material assets into the back. I got so excited. Okay. Once it turns black, we should be good to go. And the only input I need is those RGB values for the color. And then what we can do is swap out that asset. So if I say replace materials assets, I want to input the appearance asset here and then change these materials down here. So I'm going to feed these materials in and hopefully that works. Okay, so the quirk I had was I still had the rendering dialog box open while this was updating. So then if I just override, I re-enabled this update material. All right, we back, we back, okay. Sweet. So we're here, we're done. Render, try this one more time. So I have to close the render window when not in use so that we can use Rhino Insight once again. That's a key takeaway. And 
And yeah, it looks like everything is working as intended. Again, I've got that consistent colors set, so that's not getting the shadows in there awkwardly. And we've got the, the materials working, so awesome. All right, thanks so much for tuning in to this tutorial where we covered Rhino Inside, adjusting materials on a per instance basis, per panel basis. I know it gets a little quirky. There's some order of operations happening there. Um, even some syntax errors that I experienced when we did the live session. But hopefully you like this one. If you did, hit that like button and consider subscribing to come on back. We're gonna be producing all kinds of workflows, including Rhino and Grasshopper, but more than that, design technology and architecture. So. Let me know what you want to learn next in the comments below. Let me know what you tried out. I'd love to see any screenshots you may want to share or post. And as always, stay curious, my friend, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.